milí diváci, tí, čo ste pritomní tu v komunitnom centre Veritas, aj tí, čo nás sledujete online, vitajte na 7. ročníku Košických Hanusových dní. Košické Hanusové dni sú kultúrno-akademický festival na priesečníku kresťanstva dnešnej spoločnosti. Organizátorom festivalu je spoločenstvo Ladislava Hanusa. Katolické akademické spoločenstvo, otvorené pre všetky ľudí hľadajúcich pravdu. Ak by ste sa chceli stať súčasťou tohto spoločenstva, môžete sa prihlásiť nášho formačno-akademického programu. Najbližšie otvárame semestrálny program v Košiciach a bude spustený, teda bude prebiehať od februára a spustená registrácia je od teraz až do konca januára. A keď sa prihlásite do konca tohto roka, tak budete mať zľavu 10 Viac informácií na slh.sk. Pri príležitosti 20. výročia spoločenstva Ladislava Hanusa tento rok zakladáme Inštitút Ladislava Hanusa, ktorým chceme tú službu a to, čo robíme, posunúť ešte na vyššiu úroveň. A ak sa vám páči to, čo robíme a chcete, aby sme to robili ešte lepšie a ešte viac toho robili, tak nás môžete aj finančne podporiť a stať sa súčasťou tohto príbehu. Ako to môžete urobiť a viac informácií o inštitúte môžete nájsť na stránke donio.sk lomeno ILH, ako vidíte na obrazovkách. No a hlavní partnery podujatia sú Fond na podporu umenia, ktorý podporil Festival z verejných zdrojov, spoločnosť Plout, opáctvo Radu Premonštrátov, Lesy Jasov a nadácia Fides et Ratio. Hlavní partnery mediálni sú konzervatívny denník Postoj, portál Nové mesto a denník Štandard. No a dnes večer nás čakajú teda dve podujatia. O malú chvíľu začne prednáška Roda Drehera o stredoeurópskej duši, o 17.30 teraz teda, a o 20. diskusia na výške do hĺbky, ako nepreflákať študentské roky. No a do diskusie sa môžete zapojiť aj prostredníctvom aplikácie Slido. Stačí, ak si dáte do prehľadača, že sli.do a to heslo je, že hashtag KHD22. Ak by ste potrebovali sa pripojiť na Wi-Fi, tak to môžete urobiť na Wi-Fi s názvom Veritas Hostia a heslo je všetko s malým a bez diakritiky Kaviaren. No a v tejto chvíli už iba odozdám slovo moderátorovi Samuelovi Trizuliakovi. Dear ladies and gentlemen, počujete ma? Can you hear me? Dear ladies and gentlemen, a year or two ago, a friend of mine, a Catholic from the Czech Republic, ironically commented to me that our festival, the Hanus Days, might perhaps well also be called the Dreher Days. I think he meant it kind of sarcastically, being somewhat critical of the unambiguously Christian and unapologetically conservative nature of our festival, its program, and its identity. But I guess we today might as well take it as a compliment. I think it's no exaggeration to say that our guest for today, Rod Dreher, belongs among the most well-known Christian journalists of our time. And across the past decade, he has been an important voice in the, deba in the debate about the place of Christianity in contemporary culture of the West. He's a longtime senior writer at the American Conservative, and he's the author of best-selling books such as How Dante Saved My Life, Benedict Option, and most recently, live not by lies. I think that if we, the Hanus Days, can borrow a little bit of his fame, good for us, and perhaps if he can borrow a little bit of ours, well, good for him too as well. Rod, in any case, is a dear friend of the Hanus Days. The idea for his most recent book, Live Not by Lies, was in fact, I think, partly inspired by his first visit to Bratislava in 2019. And the meetings he had at the time with Catholic dissidents from the times of the communist Czechoslovakia. He spoke at Bratislava Hanus Days once again since then, and it is a pleasure to welcome him today in Košice too. He joins us from Budapest, Hungary, where he recently moved to work with the Danube Institute. Rod has recently spent a lot of time in Central Europe, and it is a great pleasure that today he will speak to us precisely on this topic the soul of Central Europe. Rod, welcome to Košice, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction, and thank you for coming out uh, today. It's, it is like coming back home to come to Hannes Days, because this is 
where at Hanu stays in Bratislava, where the whole project that turned into the book Live Not By Lies began. Uh, the book it has been out for two years now. It sold uh, over 200,000 copies globally, which is a, a, a really big success. But I owe it all, or owe it mostly at least, to the kindness of you all at Hanus Days for introducing me to these amazing figures in the underground church in this country, figures who still play a, a big role in my own life. Uh, and I, I'm going to talk about that today. Now, growing up in America during the Cold War, the only thing that most of us Americans knew about Central Europe was that you were par a part of the world that was occupied and oppressed by the Soviet Union. They were the evil empire, we were the good guys, and one day you would be free. And then there was a pope who came from Poland. I remember some people, my family included, thought that, well, maybe this is a sign that communism has infiltrated the Catholic Church. But this is how little most Americans knew about Central Europe. We had no idea that the Catholic Church in Poland was leading the resistance to communism. Well, then the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and Central Europe was free. We Americans began to see this region as liberated to enjoy the blessings of capitalism and democracy. Our collective attitude towards you uh, was summed up in a commercial for the General Electric Company, which associated itself with the rebirth of Central Europe. There was a commercial, uh, the final image of which showed an elderly couple in an elegant dress, the, the woman was in an elegant dress, they were waltzing in a Budapest ballroom. The joyful old lady tells her husband, I feel young again. And we thought, that's Central Europe. You know, they're waking up from history and they get to be just like us. Well, what we did was we reduced you all to a screen onto which we Americans projected our fantasies about who we thought you should be. But then again, I've learned since traveling through Central Europe that you do the same thing to us. Some people come to me to talk about American history, American life, American culture, and I can tell they really want to hear me say what they, what they think is true about America. And it's not a hostile thing at all. It's just that they romanticize it, and we, we can do the same thing to you. Well, unfortunately for you Slovaks, you have no choice but to know a lot about us Americans, who are like the, the Romans of our time. But we know almost nothing about you because our media, to its shame, almost never pays attention to Central Europe. Until the Russia-Ukraine war, almost the only time any co a country from this region would appear in the US media was when one of your governments did something to offend against the holy cause of LGBT rights. As far as the American news media are concerned, the only reasons to pay attention to Central Europe are to report on how agreeable the countries there are to US foreign policy goals and to condemn how backward they all are on LGBT rights. Well, I've lived in Hungary for eight months out of the last two years, and the reality of life in this region versus the image that we have from the American news media have made me trust the American news media even less than before. So how do we Americans see you today? The truth is we have no more of a clear vision now than we ever did. An American diplomat who serves in this region told me that the biggest problem with Americans who come to visit here is that they bring their own politics and their own prejudices and see what they want to see. I have to be honest, maybe I do the same thing. I'm so fond of Slovakia, so I'm only seeing the good side of it. So, uh, but uh, all I can do this evening is to talk, uh, in my talk tonight is to give you my honest impressions and to ask you to forgive me if I romanticize things. The truth is I really have come to love this region and its people. I've come to believe that you have something very important to teach us Americans, and indeed the rest of the Western world. And I have so much faith in this that a few weeks ago, I moved to Budapest to live and to work. So I'm now your neighbor. 
Well, as many of you know, I wrote a book called, in English, Live Not By Lies, two years ago. It tells the story of immigrants to America from the former communist world, including Slovakia, who now say that the things happening in America remind them of what they left behind. They're talking about the fact that one cannot say in American public life what one believes without the f having to fear that one will lose one's job or be punished in some other way. They're talking about how a new and radically intolerant left-wing ideology that has arisen and has taken over all the major institutions of American life, even the US military. We call this ideology wokeness, a term that has to do with the belief among its followers that they, and only they, are truly awake and truly enlightened. The woke say that the line between good and evil passes between races and between political parties. I dare say that any older people in this room today who remember life after, under communism, if you came to spend a, a month in America today, you would be quite alarmed at what you're seeing. Well, we Americans are completely oblivious to what's happening. Why? Well, for one, because we can't even imagine that the things that happened in Russia and Central Europe could actually happen in America. We're America. That doesn't happen here. For another thing, another reason, we have forgotten communism. Can you believe that since the end of the Cold War, American students have learned almost nothing about communism? I'm 55 years old. I grew up in, uh, in the end of the Cold War, and we all knew about communism, what it was, uh, that, that there was such a thing, and it was very oppressive. But the Berlin Wall came down. Suddenly, communism was completely forgotten in American public life. Um, it's now common to find young Americans who think that communism sounds like a fantastic idea. Uh, all that universal brotherhood and, un and universal equality, boy, that sounds great. I asked a, a young woman in California about this. She's 26 years old, and she said, gosh, I, I think I'm a communist. I think it's, it's just great to think about brotherhood and equality. I said, well, what about the gulags? She said, what? What's a gulag? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're the product of American public schools. They have no idea about the truth because older Americans, my generation and my parents' generation, have not taught them. Um, because we didn't think it was that important. In America, we're always looking to the future. Don't look in the past, look to the future. So my book, Live Not By Lies, talks about the ways this new totalitarianism resembles the Soviet version. It also features interviews with Christians from Central Europe and Russia who stayed behind and who resisted communism. In those interviews, they offer advice for how we can resist the new tyranny. The book has sold, um, as I mentioned, it sold very well, both in the US and, and, and around the, in Europe. It's been translated into 10 European languages. So maybe the message that started here in Slovakia and went on, I, I got, as I gathered more information from the Czech Republic, from Poland, from Hungary, from Russia, and other places, maybe that can turn history around. If so, I will have you in Slovakia to thank for that. If it does turn history around, then uh, it will, as I said, it'll be because of the research that started right here in Slovakia at Honor's Days in 2019. It was then and there that I made friendships which continue to this day and that I believe I will cherish for the rest of my life. Now in America, if we know anything at all about the heroes who resisted communism, then we know about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Karol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, Lech Wałęsa and Václav Havel. Yet when I first came to Bratislava, I learned of names and of stories that were unknown to me. Their stories were my first introduction to the history of Christian resistance to Soviet communism. I learned about Father Tomislav Kolakovich, a man whose example is so important that I dedicated my book to his memory. I assume that a man so great would be widely known in Slovakia, but I'm told later that this isn't true, that there are many people in this country who don't know about him. 
Well, if you don't know who he is, Father Kolakovic is a Croatian priest who arrived in this country in 1943, running away from the Nazis. He began teaching in the Catholic University in Bratislava. The priest told his students he had good news and bad news. The good news is the Germans are going to lose this war, but the bad news is that when it ends, the Soviets are going to be ruling this country, and the first thing they're going to do is persecute the church. Father Kolakovic prepared Slovak Catholics for underground resistance. Now, as I was told, the bishops chastised him, told Father Kolakovic that he was being alarmist, that what he was saying was going to happen, it, it wouldn't happen here. But Father Kolakovic understood the communist mindset better than the bishops did. He kept working. He kept building a network of prayerful, dedicated Catholics who were preparing the church to be resilient. And eventually, when the Iron Curtain fell across this country, everything happened, just like Father Kolakovic predicted. Because he had spent the previous years b helping build those networks of resistance, the underground church was strong here in Slovakia. Now, when I go around the U.S. talking about this book, I always tell the story about Father Kolakovic and tell Americans that today we are in a Kolakovic moment. That means that we don't know for how much longer we will be free to organize the, these networks and small groups to prepare for the resistance, but we cannot wait another day to get started. And when I think about the soul of Central Europe, I think first about Father Kolakovic telling his people, your people, to prepare themselves for suffering and to depend completely on Jesus Christ. Now, on that first visit to Bratislava, the church historian Jan Simulcic took me to a secret chamber hidden under a house in the suburbs. In that little room, for 10 years in the last decade of communism, the underground church produced Samizdat prayer books, hymn books, and other publications to serve the life of the church. Now, it was incredible to stand there in that little cramped room. You had to go under a tunnel to get to it, duck your head, come up in this room, and to know that uh, for 10 years they worked in that room printing these books, worried that at any moment the secret police could break in and arrest them. But that's what they did. Um, they had that much courage and dedication. Professor Simulchik was part of the underground church as a college student. He told me that going to that house week after week, risking his freedom to serve Christ and the underground church, taught him the meaning of liberty and the meaning of courage. That too, Jan Simulchik, is the soul of Central Europe. I also learned here about the priest Vladimir Yukel and the layman, Dr. Sylvester Kuchmeri, who were allies of Father Kolakovic. When I left Bratislava, my new friends, Juraj Schust and others from the Hanno States Fellowship, gave me an English language copy of Dr. Kirchmeri's memoir titled, This Saved Us. I read the whole book on the train to Prague. In it, I learned how Dr. Kirchmeri and the other Christian prisoners kept their faith, their sanity, and their charity in prison. It required disciplined prayer and contemplation. It also required keeping in the front of their minds that all suffering, everything we have to endure, is a share in the suffering of our Lord. Knowing this and uniting their suffering to Christ gave meaning to their sacrifices and made their sacrifices easier to bear. This Saved Us is the name of his book. Well, what saved them? Deep and intense faith in Christ. The passages of the book in which Dr. Kuchmeri talked about his spiritual exercises in prison, how he and other prisoners helped each other pray and to memorize passages from the Gospels, how they ministered to each other, how they sang hymns with each other, and how he, Dr. Kuchmeri, absolutely refused to hate his persecutors. Well, all of that was very difficult to read without crying. Dr. Kuchmeri publishes in that book transcripts from government trial records of his statements to the courts when they put him on trial for being a Vatican spy or whatever it was. 
In one of them, that brave man, Silvo Kirchmeri, told his persecutors, quote, you have power in your hands, but we have truth. They had truth. They had the truth of Jesus Christ. Dr. Kirchmeri also publishes the trial court's official verdicts against him. In one of them, the communist court says that religious liberty exists in Czechoslovakia. It's constitutionally guaranteed. But that cannot mean tolerating anything that gets in the way of building socialism. Well, for his part, Dr. Kirchmeri points out that the communists insist that religious liberty exists because Czechs and Slovaks are allowed to go to church. Well, Dr. Kirchmeri wrote, but Christ did not come into the world only so that people would go to church. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. To live their faith, that is what religion and the church are not allowed to do. That's what he said at a time when it could have cost him his life. So the courage and the spiritual discipline of Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri, that's also what I think about when I consider the soul of Central Europe. I also learned here about the witness of Cardinal Jan Chrysostom Koretz. His former aide, Frantisek Mikloshko, took me to the Cardinal's former apartment in Bratislava and told me amazing stories about the man's spiritual leadership. He told a story about one time the secret police were trying to arrest him and he refused to get in the car. One of the secret police ended up spilling hot coffee all over himself and ran away. Um, but that was just an amazing story for me to hear, you, a, a bishop actually resisting the, the police in that way. It's incredible. Frantisek emphasized how, the, how that bishop of the underground church believed so strongly in the power of small communities to keep the faith alive. Frantisek told me about the future Cardinal Koretz. He told us that they, the communists, could take everything from us. They could take Samizdat from us. They could take our opportunity to speak out publicly from us, but we cannot let them take away our small communities. Frantisek himself joined the underground church community in 1966, when as a university student, he met Silvo Kirchmeri and father Vlado Yukel, who recruited him into the fellowship. Frantisek told me that he learned the truth of the power of small groups through his work with the underground church. He said, quote, it's like in the Bible, the parable of the 10 righteous people. True, in Slovakia, there were many more than 10 righteous people, but 10 would have been enough. You can build a whole country on 10 righteous people who are like pillars, like monuments. On a later visit to Slovakia, I went to the grave of Cardinal Koretz in Nitra. I fell on my knees, put my forehead on the ground, and begged him for his prayers that I would do a good job of telling the story of his people and of their resistance to communism. So when you ask me about the soul of Central Europe, I'll tell you the story of Cardinal Koretz and of Frantisek Mikloshko. These names, Kolakovic, Kuchmeri, Yukul, Koretz, Mikloshko, and others, are they well known in your country today? Well, they're starting to become known in my country. They are the great men your country produced in the 20th century. They came from this tiny country in Central Europe, ignored by the great and powerful United States of America, but they have so much to say to us today as we prepare for dark and dangerous times to come. Their message is a message that comes straight from the soul of Central Europe's Christians, that suffering has value, that suffering is the means of our liberation, that if we want a share in Christ's victory, we must also share in his suffering. Now, it's hard to think of a more countercultural message in the West today, and it's also hard to think of a more necessary one. At the core of this new soft totalitarianism that's rising is the promise that a world free of suffering can be ours if only we will give our souls to the system and allow the system to eliminate all struggle, all things that make us feel unsafe and uncomfortable, even struggle against the people who, that the new ideology identifies as evil. If only we can purge the world of these counter-revolutionaries, of these people, these Christians and others who think bad thoughts and say bad things, 
Well, then, my friends, we can live in paradise. That's what they say. We have all heard of George Orwell's famous novel, 1984, which is the model for totalitarianism in the minds of most Americans. But fewer people have heard of Aldous Huxley's earlier novel, Brave New World, which presents a very different kind of totalitarianism than Orwell's work. In Orwell, the totalitarian state enforces its laws with pain and fear and terror. But in Huxley's novel, the state doesn't need to torture anybody. Everybody wants to be part of the system, which provides them with cradle-to-grave care, with free drugs, with constant entertainment, with all the sex you can handle, and even pornography. The people are kept in a state of spiritual anesthesia. But people choose this world because they're taught that the greatest evil of all is to be unhappy. Believe it or not, there was a, a college student, a college professor, a friend of mine, who told me that he quit teaching Brave New World to his students because they didn't see what was wrong with this world. They thought it sounded great. They wanted to be part of it. They completely missed the point of the book. Because this is our world today. This is the temptation that all of us face, even people in Central Europe, of course. A young Hungarian Catholic friend of mine told me that her great fear is that her generation, knowing nothing of the experience of communism, they were too young to remember when communism fell, that her generation wants nothing more than to turn their country into a Magyar Sweden. That is, they want it to be a consumerist, welfare state utopia where everyone lives in total comfort and total sexual freedom with no responsibilities to the past or to the future. The experience of communism and the soul of Central Europe ought to be protection against these temptations. My friend Timo Krishka, a Bratislava photographer who was a small boy when communism ended, he came to understand this a few years ago. Timo's great-grandfather, a Greek Catholic priest, was forced out of the ministry in the 1950s for refusing the government's order to convert to the Orthodox Church, which at that time was under Soviet control. That priest, Father Michael Durishin, chose a life of suffering for himself and for his family rather than stain his conscience by betraying his faith. Well, several years ago, Timo set out to honor his ancestor's sacrifice by interviewing and photographing the still living Slovak survivors of communist persecution, including original members of Father Kolakovich's fellowship, the family. As he made his rounds around this country, Timo was shaken up, not by the stories of the suffering he heard, he expected those, but rather by the intense inner peace radiating from the faces of these elderly believers. Now, these men and women had been around Timo's age when they had everything taken away from them but their faith in God. And yet, over and over, they told their young visitor that in prison for Christ, they found true inner liberation through suffering. One Christian, separated from his wife and five children and thrown into solitary confinement, testified that he had moments there that were, quote, like paradise. Can you imagine? Well, Timo told me, quote, it seemed to me that the less they were able to change the world around them, the stronger they had become. These people completely under, uh, changed my understanding of freedom. My project changed from looking for victims to finding heroes. I stopped building a monument to an unjust past and began to look for a message for us, the free people. The message he found was this, that the secular liberal ideal of freedom that's so popular in the West and among many people in the post-communist generation here in Slovakia, that it's a lie. That is, the concept that real freedom is found by liberating the self from all binding commitments to God, to marriage, to family, etc., and by increasing worldly comforts, that that is a road that leads to hell. Timo observed that the only force in society standing in the middle of that wide road to hell yelling stop were the traditional Christian churches. And then it hit him. He said to me, with our eyes fixed intently on the West, 
we could see how it was beginning to experience the same things we knew from the time of totalitarianism. Once again, we're all being told that Christian values are the things that are standing in the way of people having a better life. But history has already shown how far these things can go. We also know what to do now in terms of making life decisions, said Timo. From his interviews with former Christian prisoners, Timo also learned something important about himself. He had always thought that suffering was something to be escaped. Yet he never understood why the easier and the more free his professional and personal life became, his happiness did not increase. Why? His generation was the first one since the Second World War to know liberty. So why did he feel so anxious and never satisfied? Well, those meetings he had with elderly Slovak dissidents, Christian dissidents, revealed a life-giving truth to Timo. It was the same truth that it took Alexander Solzhenitsyn a tour through the gulag prisons uh, to, to learn. Timo said, accepting suffering is the beginning of our liberation. Let me repeat that. Accepting suffering is the beginning of our liberation. Suffering can be the source of great strength. It gives us the power to resist. It is a gift from God that invites us to change, to start a revolution against the oppression. But for me, said Timo, the oppressor was no longer the totalitarian communist regime, and it's not even the progressive liberal state. Meeting these hidden heroes started a revolution against the greatest totalitarian ruler of all, myself. Timo Krieska is also the soul of Central Europe. He discovered a subtle but immensely important truth, that we ourselves are the ultimate rulers of our own consciences. Hard totalitarianism depends on terrorizing us into surrendering our free consciences. Soft totalitarianism uses fear as well, but uh, mostly it bewitches us, it seduces us with therapeutic promises of entertainment, pleasure, and comfort, including in the phrase of Mustafa Mond, who is the dictator of Brave New World, Christianity without tears. But the truth cannot be separated from tears. To live in truth requires us to accept suffering, to deal with it. In Brave New World, Mustafa Mond appeals to the dissident who lives outside the system, a guy named John the Savage. Mond appeals to him to leave his wild life in the woods and to return to the comforts of civilization. But the savage refuses the temptation. He says to Mond, I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin. In fact, says Mustafa Mond, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right then, said the savage defiantly, I am claiming the right to be unhappy. The right to be unhappy is the cost of true liberty. And this is what it means to live in truth. There's no other way. There's no escape from the, tr from the struggle and anyone who tells you that there is, is lying. So what has this American, what have I learned from encountering the soul of Central Europe? I have learned the meaning of suffering and the secret to a faith that endures. Now, believe it or not, I have to get personal here for a second. This has helped me a lot in my own personal struggles. I have thought a lot about Sylvester Kirchmeri and the other example of the others I met in Slovakia. As some of you know, if you follow my blog, I'm going through a divorce right now. My marriage broke down a decade ago under a lot of pressure. Uh, there was no infidelity, nothing like that, but my wife still filed for divorce this past spring. It has been extremely painful. Divorce is not something that's supposed to happen to conservative Christian men like me or women, uh, but it happened. And I've thought a lot about Dr. Kirchmeri as I've grieved the loss of my own marriage. His testimony in particular has helped me to deepen my own faith while not surrendering to despair or the temptation to hate my wife. I'm not saying that living through a divorce that you didn't choose is like living in a communist prison. I don't want to say that at all. But there are those temptations, the temptations to pity yourself, the temptations to hate the wife who did this to you, the, the temptations to sit there in the past and to build a monument to an unjust and unhappy past. 
Dr. Kirchmeri, through his example and through his prayers, because I would ask him for his prayers from time to time, he has helped me through that and helped me to find a, so, so much of a deeper faith in Christ through this suffering. Now, if we never truly experience soft totalitarianism in America, then I can still say that the soul of Central Europe changed my heart for the better and made it easier for me to bear suffering and to testify to the fact that Jesus Christ is the victor. That is what we Americans can learn from you, from Slovakia, in your history. But what can you learn from us? I hate to say it, but these days, we Americans tend to be a negative example to you all. Just before I came up here, I checked Twitter, uh, as one does, and there was a story there about how the U.S. State Department gave $20,000 to the country of Ecuador, a poor nation in South America, to have drag queen shows for children. $20,000 for that. The person who put this on Twitter said, how did it happen that our country used to be a source of so much goodness and light and truth in the world, and now we just send this filthy, destructive stuff, destructive of the faith, and destructive of the family. This is what we send overseas. Well, sometimes when I travel throughout Central Europe, whether it's Poland, uh, this country, Hungary, wherever I go, I sometimes meet older people, men and women who lived through the communist days, and they'll ask me, what happened to America? They mean that they once looked to us Americans as a source of light and of hope and of liberty. Now, though, they see America as the source of destructive ideas like gender ideology that threaten their societies. I hate to say it, but they're right. America today is an example of what happens when you disconnect freedom from responsibility. It's what happens when a nation, a once great nation, forgets God and believes that maximizing individual happiness and pleasure is the greatest goal in life. It's what happens when a rich, free, and democratic people exchanges meaning for the sake of power. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that um, when he first went into the gulag, he was listening to other prisoners talk about how the Bolshevik curse came to Russia and the prisoners were saying, it's because men have forgotten God. Solzhenitsyn said he thought that that was a very shallow answer, that sh surely the truth must be deeper than that. But after spending many years in the gulag, he realized that was actually what happened. Men had forgotten God, and that's how they allowed the curse of Bolshevism to come into their country. And I think whatever we're gonna call this curse that's afflicting America now and spreading throughout the West, the ultimate cause of it is man has forgotten God and makes himself into God. Silvo Kirchmeri, Vlado Yukel, and these other men, and the women whose names I don't even know, they saw what was coming, and they prepared themselves to bear witness to Christ and to help others to come to know Christ and to bear witness to Christ through whatever was to come. My God, we need them. We need their memories. We need their story, and we need their faith. It's so very sad to see what's happening to my country as it falls apart in decadence, because I love my country. I expect to go back there one day. It's a land of my fathers, and it's a land of my children. But it is a nation that has lost its way because it has lost its God. Please don't let this happen to you, please. Please don't let the holy sacrifices of the Kirchmeris, the Yukels, the Koretzes, and all the other brave men and women be in vain. Slovakia is a tiny nation, but it is a land of spiritual giants. Be worthy of those giants, and you will light the way out of darkness for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Rod, for your talk. Uh, for reminding us of all the important stories <clears throat> and these treasures that we have in the history of the church in Slovakia and in Central Europe more generally. Mm. I, was, I was thinking how to kick off our discussion, how to start, start off. Um, and I'll start on, on, on this theme. Um, I remember when your book, Live Not By Lies, was about to come out. Uh, I was speaking with Juraj Schust and Juraj came along to me and kind of winked at me and said, 
Samuel, I think for the first time we managed to do some cultural export at the Hans days. <laughs> And I think it is, it is really something new for us that some, some stories, some writings of Slovak Catholics, Slovak Christians are read and spoken about abroad. We are used to reading French theology and German theology, and it's usually the other way around. So perhaps can you share as, as, as a first topic for our discussion something about the reception of your book, Live Not By Lies, in the United States and elsewhere? Um, how have you heard or seen this affect um, the lives of communities and people over there? You know, it's been a real blessing. At first, I didn't think it was going to go great because my previous book, The Benedict Option, had lots and lots of media coverage, and it sold well. But this book came out after four years of Donald Trump, and the media changed completely. They didn't want to hear anything critical of the liberal order. I thought, well, the book won't sell. In fact, it sold twice as many copies as The Benedict Option because people in America, church people, know that we don't live in normal times. They know that something is coming. And this book and the words in the book uh, from people of Central Europe and Russia help them to understand what's happening in America today. When I go around to churches to talk about it, people will come up to me, ordinary people, Protestants, Catholics, it doesn't matter, and say, I read that book. I'm trying to do what Father Kolakovich did. I'm trying to make this happen in our church. We're putting together small groups like the family, et cetera, et cetera. And I just smile because I know what Juraj Schuss would say back in Slovakia if he knew that there in Colorado or somewhere in, in America, there are these evangelicals who are trying to imitate Dr. Kirchmeri and Father Konakovic. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. There's, uh, the books continued to sell well. And uh, as things have gotten worse in America, as wokeness has gotten even more severe, as gender theory, gender ideology has taken over even schools. Do you know we even have in America kindergartens where they're teaching uh, about gender fluidity and things like that. There are even some states in America, very liberal states, that have passed laws saying that if a minor, you know, someone who's not yet an adult, age 15 or older, wishes to have transgender surgery or hormones, but the parents say no, the state can take that child and give them the hormones. As this stuff has happened more and more, people begin to realize, my God, what's happening? We need to know more. And so they turn to this book. Um, right now, they're, they're trying, these filmmakers are trying to raise money with Jordan Peterson to work on a, a documentary. And I tell them, please hurry, because some of these people, I write about it in the book, they're not going to be alive much longer. Already one of them, this Hungarian woman I wrote about, who was a hero of 1956, she died two months ago. We don't have forever with these people. But I'm just thrilled that the book has done so well and that the message from this country and other countries of Central Europe has been so well received. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being instrumental in that as well. I would like to ask a second question and perhaps um, to ask you to perhaps challenge a little bit the analysis that you propose in this talk uh, and also in the book Live Not By Lies. Uh, I like the concept that you call soft totalitarianism, which is different from the kind of totalitarianism that we experienced in the middle of the 20th century in places like Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Um, and one thing, one difference that I find between soft totalitarianism and hard totalitarianism is that um, that today many people who you often speak about LGBT rights as kind of one, one of the, how to say it, uh, horses of the soft totalitarianism. Well, many people actually believe in this authentically, you know. Many of us have friends who are liberals who are on the other side of the political spectrum. And it seems to me that they really do strongly believe, you know, authentically it's supported by their life experience. Um, and this is quite a strong contrast to kind of harder, harder totalitarianism when kind of nobody really believed in communism in Slovakia, you know. Havel famously uh, has the story in the, in the Power of the Powerless essay that, you know, the gardener um, has the sign, uh, workers of the world unite, but he uh, just... Green, Havel's green yeah, grocer, yeah. Right, uh, the grocery store or whatever. But, it, but the point is, the, the, the sign is there because uh, um, it has to be there, but everybody knows that nobody believes in it. I think the difference today is that with soft totalitarianism, many people do genuinely and authentically believe this, these ideas. So how do you, in your experience, uh, find kind of balancing and appreciating the authenticity, authenticity of the people on the other side of the spectrum, and at the same time also appreciating the danger to which you often you know, uh, sign in your speeches? No, that's a very good question. Uh, but remember, when Havel wrote Power of the Powerless, that was 1977. 
It was after almost 30 years of communism in this country. People had lived with it, and they saw what it was really all about. I don't think that everybody felt that way when communism first came here. I, I read a, a book, I forget the woman's name now. I, I quoted her in Live Not By Lies. She was a Jewish woman from Prague. She escaped the, um, the Nazi death camps. And she said that she and her husband, also a Czech Jew, became communists, not really because they were convinced by Marxism, but because the communism was the farthest thing from Nazism, and they needed something to give them hope. And of course, they found out soon enough what the truth was. But uh, Czesław Miłosz, the, the Polish poet and essayist who once was a communist, he wrote in his book, uh, The Captive Mind, which came out in America in, I think, 1953, he said that Americans tend to think the only reason people accept communism is the Russians have a gun to their head. That's not true, he said. It's true for some. But he said there are a lot of people who are generally drawn to the, the ideals of universal brotherhood, you know, of equality and all that. It's a lie, but they're authentically drawn to it, especially if they don't have religious faith because they need something to believe in. Now, I think it's certainly true what you say, that people do believe in wokeness, and, uh, but it, they believe in it as an ideology. I don't know how it is in Slovakia, but in the U.S., they believe in it so strongly that they cannot and will not tolerate anyone who disagrees with them. Um, most Christians I know don't want to suppress gays. You know, they want to live in some sort of social peace with them. But the, the LGBT activists and their allies cannot bear the thought that somewhere in this world there is a Christian who disapproves of them. And that is the, I mean, nobody's putting you in jail for that. The state doesn't have the power to do that yet. But it's still the case that if, you bec if this becomes known, then uh, you, you could be forced out of your job, out of a position in public life. You can lose friends, you can lose your business, and so on and so forth. It's not going to be the state that's going to come to Havel's Green Grocer, but it's going to be the mob. It's going to be the bank. This is happening, too, where banks are now starting to refuse to do business with people who are ideological enemies. I mean, this is how it happens. Yeah, I hear there's also opening a new market in many places, in many businesses uh, in the U.S., uh, which kind of aims for conservative customers, uh, which want their money to be well given to companies which are ideologically aligned with them. It's a kind sure. of whole new phenomenon today. And can I tell you this, too? There was a, when I was in Budapest in the spring, we had a conference at the Danube Institute where I work um, about conservatism. There were a lot of British people there. It was about British conservatism mostly. But we had a, a professor from London who had just done a big study of the political attitudes of American young people aged 30 and younger, uh, adults. And he told everybody, conservatives have has got to fight the culture war above anything else. Why? Because an overwhelming number of young Americans um, have no respect for freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association, the kind of things that are a normal part of classical liberal societies that everybody in the past supported. Now these young people don't support them if they are used to harm minorities, to make the minorities feel unsafe. This is not a theoretical uh, problem that right now it's soft, but this totalitarianism, as my Czech friend Yaroslav keeps telling me, it's soft now, but it's not gonna stay soft. Okay, thank you. Um, I remind our guests here in the audience that there will be opportunity to ask questions uh, from the audience directly as well. You're also welcome to throw more questions on Slido and I'll translate them if they're in Slovak or I'll ask them in English. I'll move on to Slido shortly. I just have one more question about Central Europe. Um, and let's put it this way. So all of the stories that you also shared with us today, uh, the stories of the heroes of the underground church in Slovakia, they're stories of people who how to put it, uh, the nature of their activities was in some way apolitical. You may have heard that Sylvester Kretschmer and his colleagues kind of encouraged their followers to not take any political stance, just to focus on spiritual formation. Um, and uh, I think um, many people today look to Central Europe, uh, look to the well current government in Poland or the current government in Hungary. Hungary is a place where you reside. 
And there you see a great people, well, people, this is what people say. People say that there is a great kind of over politicization of Christianity. You know, sometimes Orban himself kind of, you could say, portrays himself as a defender of Christianity, which is, you know, in some, some sense, this is a phenomenon of Central Europe. Perhaps it has something to do with the soul of Central Europe. But it sounds like the, it's, it's very opposite in its nature to the kind of testimonies that we see in these heroes of the underground church who kind of try to live out the faith and the first principle they had was kind of being apolitical. So I guess, yeah, how do you, how do you comment on the situation in Central Europe in this regard? Uh, yeah, another great question. You gotta keep in mind that for Kirchmeri, Yukel and the others, there was no possibility of participating in normal political life as a Christian uh, and, and under communist totalitarianism. Václav Benda, the, uh, the Catholic hero in Prague, uh, he taught what he called anti-political politics, that you don't have to participate in the government in order to do politics. Doing politics is just fighting for the common good of all. If you can find some ways of doing that that doesn't challenge a the government, then you have to do it as a Christian. But the world that we live in today, the world that um, Viktor Orban is leading in and other uh, politicians are living in or are trying to lead in. It is not a totalitarian world yet, and I hope it doesn't become one. I think it's good that leaders like or Orban are defending the traditional family, are defending the spaces for the church to operate and other culture-making institutions to operate. I think it's certainly possible that politics and religion can become too entwined. I think, for example, you may know I, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Christian, and I think that the role of the Russian church in the war in Ukraine and blessing the war in Ukraine has been devastating for the, um, for the spiritual authority and moral authority of the church. So it's certainly possible to do that. But as, um, as Dr. Kirchmeri said, I quoted him in the, in the talk, that uh, we don't become Christians just to go to church. We become Christians to improve society. And uh, ultimately, if we, we can improve society all we want, but we're, church is just an NGO, if that's all we do, it has to come from spiritual conversion. But uh, we can't just hold it all inside. We have to work for the redemption of the world. When I look to somebody like Viktor Orban, now I know he's a hate figure in much of Europe and in the United States, but um, I see somebody who is trying to do it the best he can to protect the things that make for a healthy society, the natural family, the rights of the churches and, and schools. But he said one time something that really impressed me. He said, look, as a politician, I can't give you meaning. I can give you things, but I can't give you meaning. What I think he meant by that was, as a politician, he can do his best to pass laws to protect the ability of institutions like the family, like the church, like the schools, et cetera, to, um, to give meaning. But you can't look to politics for that alone. I will just try to push you a little bit more on this one, if I may. Um, I think if I recall a quote by Viktor Orban from the middle of last summer when the CPAC, a Republican lobbying group, had a conference in Budapest and Orban had a speech with 13 points uh, kind of recommending conservatives across the world how to win elections. And one of them was, be aware of the responsibility that you have before God, you know? And that's a, that's a really kind of serious thing to say, right? Uh, for somebody who has, you know, about whom it seems there are serious allegations of corruption and, you know, suppression of the freedom of media. And I'm not an expert, but there's, you know, people say it so much and so often that it feels that it would be unlikely that something like that wouldn't happen, you know, if, if power corrupts, as they say. So, um, yeah, do you, don't you feel that there's, right now in, in Hungary, uh, perhaps uh, some of the hope that conservatives have in, in it being a kind of place where Christianity is, is defended is, is, is misplaced? Yeah, I mean, I, I have been told by enough Hungarians that they're sick of the corruption in the government. I have to believe that it must be there. I mean, I don't speak Hungarian, and I, I haven't seen it myself. But assuming for the sake of argument that it's there, I, I, can, I can accept that. Um, an American diplomat told me that the same one I quoted earlier, he said that the worst problem in all of Central Europe is corruption. In every country here, it's corruption. He said it's just the way of life. It's left over from the communist years, and these countries over here will not progress until they find a way to deal with corruption. And if that's true of Hungary, then that, that is certainly the case. And 
Viktor Orban will live or die or be judged by his own words. You know, that said, um, you know what, we can't let the perfect become the enemy of the good enough. I did not like Donald Trump. I did not vote for him the first time because I think he's a personally corrupt man in a way that, um, that many other leaders aren't. Nevertheless, this guy comes into office and he does an amazing amount of good, especially on the question of abortion and, uh, and of uh, appointing judges to the courts. I was surprised by it, I was shocked by it, and I had to realize that we would live in a very different country, in a country that's less free and less moral if Trump had not been president, if Hillary Clinton had won. So what do we do with that? Does that suddenly make Trump a good man? No, I don't think it does. But it does show that we live in an imperfect world. And uh, we can't wait for altar boys to become prime ministers or presidents if we have serious battles in front of us, like the battle for the right to life, the battle for the protection of the family, and so on and so forth. The, the problem is, and, and I know you know this, is that at what point do you cross the line and compromise too much of your integrity for the sake of power? That's something that has to be in front of every Christian voter and every Christian politician. Thanks. I will move to the questions from Slido. And I'm grateful that this first question uh, did appear, and I will read it as it is there. I am a homosexual. I am a Catholic. What is love? Please think about it, being open-minded and honest. Thank you for answering. Yeah, thanks for the question. My oldest friend in the world is a gay Catholic, and he's chaste because, because he's a Catholic and because he wants to obey what the church teaches. But it's not just because he wants to obey the law. He carries a very heavy cross of loneliness. And I have immense respect for him because I see the burden he has. But he believes that God himself is love, and God spoke, spoke to us and speaks to us through the Bible and through the church. And God, if we, can, if we see, we can't go against God on this and say that, no, we know better what love is than God does, because God is a very source of love. I think that, that, that to love somebody is to want what's best for them, not necessarily what they want for themselves. Um, if I can be personal, in my own case, you know, I, I've been in a suffering, as my wife has, in a bad marriage for a long time. And we had to, in order to be faithful to our vows, faithful to our God, and faithful to our children, and our responsibilities to our children, we had to accept a certain amount of suffering within that marriage, of a of lack of love. But the love of God has compensated for that. It's a difficult thing. I don't mean to in any way dismiss the pain here, the dying to self, but I've had to learn myself by, uh, through chastity and through making the sacrifice for a greater love. I sacrificed my own desire for a personal love, for married love, I had to sacrifice it to a greater love for God and also for my children. So uh, I would say that we, all of us are obliged to chastity. People who, are, uh, who have same-sex attraction have a much greater burden to carry than, than the rest of us. We can marry, for example, but we're finding today more and more people, young people, are not able to marry or not marrying or not find, finding a partner. And uh, in a lot of churches in America, these single Christians say they feel all alone, that nobody sees them, that church is only for families. I think that's a mistake. Churches have got to be there for uh, homosexual Christians, for Christians who, for whatever reason, aren't partnered. But that doesn't mean that we all, that any of us have an excuse not to obey the teachings of the church and to obey Christ. Thanks. I'll move to the next question, which is connected to what you have just been talking about, as well as the, one of the messages of your talk, which is about suffering. An anonym asks, how should we promote the idea of accepting the suffering voluntarily? How could we present it, this idea, to the new generation? What should motivate them to do so? Boy, that is such a difficult question because you have to break through the propaganda from our pop culture that tells them that you can do whatever you want and that the point of life is to be happy and fulfilled. But if you look around at this culture now, do people look happy and fulfilled? 
A friend of mine is a, uh, a dean, a, a top administrator at a college in the U.S., and he told me that they've just hired a full-time therapist to go live in the dorms, the dormitories, because more than 80% of the students there, undergraduate students, are on taking some kind of drug for depression. It's overwhelming. The most connected uh, uh, generation in world history, we call them Generation Z, the, those born in 2004 and after, they're also the loneliest. Seven in 10 of them told a, a poll taker that they considered themselves lonely. So all of this, this ease, this life of, of constant entertainment and so-called happiness is making people miserable. I think the thing to do, uh, one thing we can do, is not just lecture people and say, this is why you're unhappy. We have to tell them stories. We had, uh, when I sat there and listened to Timo Kriska talk about these old people he met who had had everything taken from them but were so peaceful. And Timo has a book he published uh, here, and I forget the name of it in Slovak, but a book of the photographs he took of these people and their testimonies. It's unbelievable. It's... There's something there that you can't deny. I remember one of the favorite, one of my, the, the best things I ever heard a church leader say, Pope Benedict said that the greatest arguments for the faith are the art the church produces and the saints. And what he's saying is this, that you know, we can all slap down propositional arguments, you know, rational arguments. People can come up with all these defenses there, but who can defend themselves against the experience of great beauty? Who can defend themselves against the experience of intense holiness in a, in a person? These people and this, this art makes faith incarnate, and that's a thing that draws us in. So to answer the question, if we show the young what it means to live a life of sacrifice and how the life of Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta, for example, compare that to Kim Kardashian. For, I mean, which one is more attractive? Superficially, I guess, Kim Kardashian and Beverly Hills. But if you ask a person, a young person deep down, they have that idealism. We have to appeal to that idealism, that desire to sacrifice, to live a life of integrity, a life of weight, not a life of unbearable lightness. Thanks. I think we will take some questions from the audience. Do we have any volunteers? Can we have some light maybe to see the person asking the question? Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Yeah. Not, not like we can see them or anything. We... Okay, the gentleman in the first row, please say your name and your question. My name is Michael. <clears throat> My question is actually the most liked one in the Slido currently. Uh, it's a question regarding very tragic uh, event that happened in Bratislava last week. Uh, two members of the LGBT community got <clears throat> murdered by a far-right um, terrorist who published his manifesto before um, performing the murder. And immediately after the, the attack, the conservative Christians in this country, the media, the, the, the clergy and so on, um, immediately got accused by the left um, of having blood on their hands. Um, some of the conservative Christians decided to, to remain silent, to, to wait until the, the, mm, the storm comes down. Uh, some of the conservatives decided to immediately react, to defend themselves. What would you consider to be um, the right answer of conservative Christians to, to such a tragedy? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I heard about this earlier today, and of course it's horrible. Violence, any kind of violence, is absolutely unacceptable. All Christians must condemn it. Because in the end, we are called to love even those who hate us. And uh, I, I think that those far-right people who committed this horrible crime are only helping the people that they hate. And, but it must be something condemned, and I do condemn it. And I think all decent people, Christian or not, condemn it. I would have stood up and defended it and would not have accepted this, the slander of the left that Christians have blood on their hands. We see this constantly in the U.S. around the transgender issue. You know, it, it is a form of blackmail. They say, 
if you don't give us what we want, then trans will commit suicide and you'll have blood on your hands. I, I, it is a form of moral blackmail, and it, 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 we have to stand up against it. We can't sit there and let them say, say these things, because by our silence, we indicate, or we may s send a message to people out there who are wondering, we may, they may think, well, gosh, maybe these Christians do feel guilty about it. Now, it is certainly a case, whenever you have an incident like this, it's a good idea for Christians to look into their own hearts and to see if they have any hatred against gay people, uh, and to see if their words uh, were hateful, and maybe repent of it. If you have sinned, go to confession, repent of it, but never apologize for standing up for truth. You have to stand up for truth and love, but that also means defending LGBT people against the physical attacks from the far right. We have to do that, I think, even if they wouldn't defend us from attacks from Antifa, for example, because this is happening in the U.S. now. Antifa and some others are, are, are attacking abortion clinics, burning abortion clinics down after the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, this has been completely ignored by the media. There was a great story this week about how 70, 70 um, abortion clinics have been, uh, uh, pro-life uh, centers have been uh, damaged or burned or uh, otherwise vandalized since the, the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. You don't see anybody on the left denouncing that. Many of them think, or maybe we can say by their silence, they seem to think that pro-lifers deserve it. Well, we can't be that way. We've got to stand on principle, and the principle is that violence is always wrong, but we will not stand there and be slandered by these people, especially in the media, who are just using, are exploiting the horrible deaths of these people to push a political agenda. I will ask another question from Slido, um, which is uh, linked to politics, uh, and we touched on Trump a little bit before. How would you explain that bad guys like Trump or Boris Kolar, who is a Slovak Polish politician who has 12 kids with nine different women, they are more conservative, and I, I think by that, by that is meant they deliver more results politically for conservatives than most of so-called decent Christians or you know those who are fully practicing and. I, I hope somebody can explain that to me because it's really difficult. Um, but you know, I, I think Donald Trump is so hard to explain. I, you know, I, I think the fact that he is so arrogant that he gets things done because he doesn't care what the left says about him. Ordinary conservative politicians in the U.S., good, decent Christian men and women, they pay attention to what the re what rest of the world says especially among the elites. And of course, the elites in America are very liberal. And so we say in English, they pull their punches, meaning conservative politicians may talk one way when they speak to conservatives, but when it comes time to vote, they always back down. Not Trump, because he's such an egomaniac, he doesn't care. Now, the, the challenge, though, is how do we vote as Christians? I mean, this is something I, I faced you know, as a Christian. What do we do when a man that we think is bad, or certainly based on his public behavior, is immoral, but he gets results that actually pass laws that affect the real world in ways that, from a Christian point of view, are positive? Now, I come from a state in, in America called Louisiana. It's in the Deep South. We were founded by the French and the Spanish, so we have more of a Latin approach to politics where we have a very high tolerance for corruption. Uh, one of the most popular governors in our state's history was this Cajun guy who loved to gamble, he had lots of girlfriends, and he joked that they would take, um, they would take his blood and use it to make Viagra. Everybody thought this was hilarious, and they voted for him anyway. Christians voted for him uh, because he was effective. I, I think that in, in the end, uh, if you are going to place, um, you can't just vote for people who are personally moral uh, because there are different kinds of moral courage. Um, somebody who, could, who is, goes to Sunday school, goes to church every Sunday, but in the end will not vote to protect life or to protect freedom of religion, things like that, 
I think they're useless. I mean, God bless them. I wish I would be as faithful as they were to church. But in the end, if you're a politician, I want to see results because the, the lives of the unborn, for example, really matter. If Donald Trump had not been president, Roe v. Wade would still be uh, the law of the land today. And that's something that I, I had to face when I thought about my own distaste for Donald Trump as a Christian and as just a, a voter, um, that this result was very good. On the other hand, Catholic Church condemns what we call in English consequentialism, the idea that the ultimate outcome of an act it determines its morality. I don't think this is really consequentialism, but it's close enough to where I have an uneasy conscience about it. Thanks. We have another opportunity to ask questions from the audience. You are welcome to ask in Slovak as well. Ste vítani položiť otázku aj po slovensky a v zápätí ju preložím ja alebo naši kamaráti a u prekladateľov. Mladý muž v prvej rade. Yes, uh... Hi, my name is Luis, and I would like to ask you a question uh, regarding our culture and the relationship of the youth regarding our culture. Um, is there a specific way the youth in Slovakia, where I think wokeness isn't fully mainstream yet, uh, a way in which they can oppose a liberal secularism that we can uh, see uh, being pushed on us, for example, from the side of the uh, European Union and uh, the elites? Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, that's the question right now. And I, I think since wokeness is not so big here yet, one thing that you can do and even reach out to people on the left is to talk about how w wokeness makes it harder to speak your mind. It makes you, it, it takes away your liberties. Um, if you go to uh, colleges now in America where wokeness is so strong, and it's in so many of these colleges, young people are afraid to say what they really think. Sitting in classes, they're terrified, not that the teacher is going to be mad at them, but that their fellow students will attack them. I mean, who wants to live in that kind of world? You, if you don't have that world now, defend your liberties. And when I say defend your liberties, I don't mean just liberties for conservatives, liberties for liberals and people of all, uh, from all perspectives to say what's on your mind. You can only ever have a free society if people are free to speak and to write. When I was in, um, in Russia doing research for Live Not By Lies, I had dinner at the home of this, um, this Russian family, Russian Orthodox family. And the father there works in the TV industry. He's a cameraman or something. And he said he realized the day, that he remembers the day that he, when he knew that the Soviet Union was going to fall. Like, when was that? He said it was in the, in the 1980 Moscow Olympics. He said that it was his first job out of film school. He was there with the crew from Soviet television to, uh, to arrange the shots for the opening ceremonies of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. He said that they were building some uh, pipe frames around the box where Brezhnev and the Politburo were going to sit for the opening ceremony. They were putting the frames there to put the lights down on, on the, uh, the general secretary and the other dignitaries. The KGB burst in and said they were Brezhnev's own agents. They said, you don't have permission to do that. They said, well, we have to. We have to have lights on the general secretary. They said, you didn't get permission. Get out of here. So they were scared, and they left. Well, to this day, if you go look on YouTube at the opening ceremony of the 1980 Moscow Olympics, you can see Brezhnev and the other dignitaries sitting in the dark. It was humiliating. The cameraman told me at dinner, he said, when we were too afraid to speak up and say that the se general secretary is going to be humiliated before the world, that's when I knew that the system was rotten because information couldn't get through it to, to, to help them deal with the real world. Now, why do I tell that story? Because this is what happens in any society or any system where information is not free. And maybe this is a way, without having to get into the politics of it, this is a way to talk among yourselves and to talk among people who don't share your religious or political convictions, but who also want to keep or should want to keep a society and a, a community in which people are free to dissent without being attacked. I mean, the fact that you have uh, the memory, the cultural memory here of communism, 
maybe the thing to do is to um, appeal to older people and to, to talk to them about your grandparents about or your parents about what life was like under communism and to uh, see what lessons you can get from them about how to defend liberty, free speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press. Because I tell you, I live in a country where this, it's still guaranteed in law, but there are more and more places where people are simply terrified to say what they really think. Not because the government is going to come arrest them, but because they don't want to lose their business, they don't want to lose their job, they don't want to stand with a mob surrounding them in the hallway at their university attacking them for holding the quote unquote wrong opinion. Next question from Slido. Mm. Small groups are more vulnerable to sectarian and odd life. There is this group mentioned in the question called Benyotsi, who were also a strange part of the underground church, which was basically a sect uh, which had some strange practices. Uh, for example, the priests were directing people home to marry and not to marry and so on and so forth. But anyways, these kind of things, this kind of dynamics sometimes appear in, in, in small groups. Are you aware of this when you are recommending kind of an urging Christians to form small groups? And how do you recommend that when we form these small groups, like people uh, did at, uh, inspired by Kulakovic and others, how, how can these groups stay sane? Yeah, there's no way to avoid it. It does happen. Sectarianism, cult-like behavior. It can happen in political groups. It can happen in religious groups. There's no way to completely avoid the risk. I think one thing we can do, though, is to make sure that the small groups are not authoritarian, that, that they, they're, they keep themselves open and accountable. Gra they should be grounded within the formal church. If you're Catholic, you know, make sure that you're rooted in the Catholic church. Um, and uh, always be humble. I mean, that's a thing that seems so difficult for people to do, is to admit that they might be wrong about something. I was talking earlier today with some of my Slovak friends about this really depressing thing we're seeing happen in America now on the whole question of the war with Russia and Ukraine. I remember when we were leading up to the Iraq war, um, I was a journalist in New York City at the time. I was down in downtown New Manhattan on 9-11. I saw the first tower come down. I went back to my house in Brooklyn covered with dust in shock. And I became a real cheerleader for the war. I thought we have to go to war and people who were against the Iraq war, they were cowards or they were fools. I didn't want to hear anything opposed to that. Well, I was the fool as I figured out later. Fast forward to now to today and you see some of the same people who got us into the Iraq war saying we can't have any dissent from the American position on Ukraine and Russia. If you dissent, you're disloyal, you're unpatriotic. I think that's crazy. Well, that same principle applies to small groups. There has to be a mechanism within small groups to allow people to dissent. And I think that if you're in a small group where that doesn't exist, then you should probably get out of it. But I, I would also say, don't let the fact that you, there's no ultimate guarantee that a small group won't go bad, don't let that stop you from at least trying. Because if you don't try, then you're not gonna have any chance. I, I talked to this woman, Sofia Romaszewska, in Poland. She was one of the heroes of the Solidarity Trade Union movement. And she said, right now, the thing that is the most important is for all these isolated and alienated, atomized young people to form groups. She said, it doesn't have to be political or religious, just something to help you remember that you are part of a community. You're not this isolated individual who is stuck alone at home with his sadness, with his fears, with his hopes, who disappears online. Get out there and see people face to face. That is one of the most revolutionary things you can do against this new soft totalitarianism. Thanks. Another question from Slido, very much connected to the spirit uh, of, of uh, the topic of uh, soul of Central Europe. Today is a liturgical feast, the liturgical feast of the Blessed Karl, Emperor Karl, the last emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Why are we missing great Christian political leaders today? Another easy question to answer. <laughs> wow. Well, I, the, the church, not just the Catholic church, all churches seem really demoralized today, you know. Um, it... 
This is something I think about a lot. I don't have any easy answers for it, but there seems to be such a lack of courage in the church today. This is one of the reasons that people like Kirchmeri and Yukul and these others really stand out in my mind because they were turned into heroes by their times. We live in very comfortable times, very middle-class times, time of technological ease. These aren't times that make for great men and women. Um, and it's so hard to speak to people and to call them out of their comfort. I mean, look, in, in my country, we had, just before I was born, Dr. Martin Luther King, who led the civil rights movement. He faced down real evil. There was, it was not a joke, there, and he ultimately paid for it with his life. But uh, we, we, we just don't have that sort of clear-cut moral issues like they did in the, in the past that would bring forth courageous leaders. Ronald Reagan was the last brave leader I can think of in my lifetime. Um, and what made him so brave was that he stared down the Soviet Union. He's brave to me and to a lot of Americans. But after the end of the Cold War, where are the great, the, the great villains? I mean, I think Putin is a villain, but he's not the same kind of villain as global Marxism, right? So um, I, I think that uh, our times are decadent, and decadent times don't tend not to produce great leaders. Uh, on the other hand, what happened to Blessed Carl? You know, he, he was a great leader, but um, he failed. And uh, I think that you have to, if, you're, if God sends us a good and holy leader, um, with the, we need to try to recognize it and to follow him or her. Uh, but trying to do that in our own, in, in, in the middle of thing, everything, all the chaos happening around us is difficult, especially if we have not been catechized in a moral way or raised in a moral way. And this, I think, is one of the big dangers of Donald Trump. Uh, there's, I'm not an evangelical, but evangelical Christians in America have this huge controversy over Trump. Because in the 80s and 90s, in the early 2000s, evangelicals in their churches pushed very, very hard that you have to only vote for moral men as for, for president or for political leadership. Well, here comes Trump, who is one of the most immoral men, and so many evangelicals of my generation and the, my parents' generation went crazy for Trump. And their kids are like, wait a minute, you're a bunch of hypocrites. What did you do? How can you? And I, I have to say, I understand where these kids are coming from. I didn't come from a religious tradition that was so moralistic. But, um, but nowadays, what do you say to these kids when you've talked about the importance of morals, and yet your parent, the parents go for a politician who is completely amoral? I, I think that has a lot to do with why these, we don't get a lot of great politicians or moral heroes anymore. So things are going to, we'll need to get worse before we, it gets better and we get better. Yeah, and leaders. you know, God forbid it should happen this winter, but I think this winter <clears throat> is going to be the breaking of a lot of European politicians and the making of some. Uh, I was told by um, a, a senior leader in a central European government about six weeks ago that the energy crisis in Europe is much worse than people understand. And this figure told me that by the end of the winter, we could see every single government in Europe fall. Nobody wants that to happen, but it could happen. And uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of turmoil. I mean, I, I moved, some friend, Hungarian friend said, why did you move here now? Isn't that like moving to Poland in August of 1939? Well, I want to be part of this because I've come to love this region and I want to, I want to share I want to share in what you're going through, because I care. And, um, and I believe that God is working out something important in, this, in Europe and in this region right now. And I think that it, we have to pray for this, pray for God to send us good and strong and moral and brave leaders to emerge from the chaos that's about to come upon us right now. Thanks. Do we have more questions from the audience? I can't see very well. Go for it. Please introduce yourself and ask, do make sure to ask a question. <laughs> this is 
bit better. <laughs> Good. Uh, hi, my, my name is Martin, and I would like to, yeah, um, working in a, a Swiss company uh, <laughs> with taxes, uh, but yeah, studying uh, political science a little bit. But my question would be, and a, a question would be about US uh, politics or about politicians. As you mentioned, uh, Reagan was one of the last, maybe, very good leaders of the may maybe Western world. What we can see now in UK as well, uh, after 45 days, they will try to find another prime minister. Maybe Boris will be back. Uh, so. Question to you, do you see anybody on the side of Republicans, maybe in the US, who can be a good leader, possibly in two years time for presidential election? We can suspect that maybe on Democrats are gonna be um, Hillary coming back or somebody else, but do you see anybody who can be then for the future kind of leader in the Western world, maybe from US? Thanks. Yeah, no, that, thank you for that question. Um, not really, but I'm, I'm fond of Governor Ron DeSantis, a go Republican governor of Florida. I think he, he's a very competent man, a good governor. He has a lot of the right instincts. A lot of the things that I liked about Donald Trump, the things Trump believed politically, DeSantis believes, but he also has none of Trump's drama, none of Trump's ego. Um, one of the things that I really liked about DeSantis and that really made him stand out to me is um, earlier this year, he passed in the Florida legislature a law that was like a very mild version of the Hungarian law about um, LGBT in schools. DeSantis said, you can't teach about LGBT issues, children age nine and younger in schools. Well, the national media went berserk about this. They said, oh, the don't say gay law, the don't say gay law. But DeSantis held his ground. And it turns out that the law was popular among Republicans and Democrats in the state of Florida, and not just in the state of Florida. It, nationwide, 53% of those who voted for Joe Biden supported this common sense law. You know, and, and I thought that was a really important sign that there is still a lot of common sense among the American people who can at least agree that little children shouldn't be propagandized for, um, for sexuality. DeSantis also, and this is so important, when the Walt Disney Company, which is really powerful in Florida because Disney World is there, when Disney World started trying to push DeSantis around to tell him, well, you need to take, get rid of this law, we're against this law, he told Disney to go to hell. And he passed, uh, he, he took away some of their tax privileges. This is unbelievable. A Republican actually standing up to big business, it must be the end of the world. But he did this, and I love it. So I think DeSantis has possibility. The problem with th is this. I mean, if DeSantis were the Republican nominee in 2024, he would be the next president. Joe Biden is senile. Nobody really believes in Joe Biden. Problem is, if Donald Trump wants the Republican nomination, he'll get it because there's such a strong core of Republicans who would die for Donald Trump that um, even DeSantis couldn't beat him. Even though DeSantis is a, would be a far more effective politician, Trump has this cult of personality that's very, very hard to come up against. And so I think we might be in the incredibly depressing condition in 2024 of seeing a Trump versus Biden rematch. These two old guys, one of whom is senile, the other of whom only wants to tweet. And if Elon Musk, Musk buys Twitter, Trump will be back on Twitter. And I, But this, to me, and all kidding aside, this is a sign of the deep decadence of our, of our political system. One more thing. I, I was talking last night in Budapest. We had a bunch of British people over um, for a conference, and there was a British historian there, too. And we were talking about how Winston Churchill could never get elected to Parliament today. Never. Much less rise to prime minister. He was an alcoholic. He had all messy finances. He this, he that. But he also stood alone against Hitler and rallied a nation. So maybe the, the problem is that we can't get good leaders because we can't get good followers either. 
Yeah, I was just struck with the idea that you said that there's a danger of uh, another Trump-Biden election, but I will just use the occasion to ask you about one other kind of rising American interesting politician about whom you, I think, wrote a lot, <clears throat> and that is uh, J.D. Wentz. J.D. Vance, yeah. Maybe if you can share a bit more. I know you've written about him a lot. Uh, do you think, what can we expect of him, and who is he, if you can uh, introduce him to this yeah, audience? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked about it. He's a friend of mine. J.D. Vance is a young man, a Republican from the state of Ohio. Uh, I first learned about J.D. in the year 2016. He had written a book called Hillbilly Elegy in English. I don't know if it's in Slovak, but he was raised in a very poor family um, in the state of Ohio. He never knew his father. His mother was a drug addict. His grandmother, she was a tough old lady with a pistol, and chain smoking. You know, these were poor people, but she gave him a sense of dignity and purpose. And he went on to go to the US Marine Corps. He got to Yale Law School. And he ended up writing a book about his memoir and about the <laughs> things he had learned from growing up as he did, about the, uh, what to do in life and what not to do. And the book became this major bestseller, weirdly enough. A friend of mine bought it for me. She said, I bet you would like this, because I come from the South and from the rural South. I read it. I loved the book. I, called, I found JD on Twitter. The book had been out for maybe a month, but it was, the sales were going down. I, I said, I love your book. Let's do an interview. We did an interview. I put it on our website. It went viral. We had two million page views of it. And suddenly, J.D. was all over the media. His career was made. It was like not a special interview. It just was one of those magical things where it just happened to hit at the right time and got shared on Facebook. So now J.D. is running for U.S. Senate from Ohio. The thing I like about him, oh, he converted to Catholicism. He's now a Catholic, is that he believes in Catholic social teaching, but he's the kind of Republican who is sick and tired of the Republican Party always taking the side of big business and globalism. He's a social and religious conservative, um, but he is also in favor of an economic system, economic changes that shore up the working class and make the, give the working class a greater, um, uh, more security in life. And for him, it's not just a matter of poverty is something he read about, he lived it. And the fact that he has that lived experience, I think, will make him a great senator if he gets elected. He's also in his 30s. If he's elected senator, I predict he's going to be president one day. Well, that's certainly more hopeful than another Biden-Trump election. Oh, yes, absolutely. But, um, you know, the thing, I, I've watched him running, J.D. running for, for Senate, and... Um, and I know him personally, I know he's a good man, he's got married with kids, and I know that he's had to do some things, just this is what you have to do to run for office in America today. Donald Trump endorsed him, which is why he won his Republican primary. Trump came to Ohio to campaign for him, and Trump stood up there on national TV and said, J.D. Vance is kissing my ass to be president, uh, to, to win this race. And it was just like, Trump humiliates everybody he's around. So um, you couldn't pay me enough to run for office, but I'm glad he's running for office. I hope he wins because we need a young conservatives like him in office, people who are, who are born or, and raised long after Reaganism. So they don't, they're not tied to the legacy of Reagan. I mean, God bless Ronald Reagan, but he was elected, what, 40 years ago? Too many conservatives in our country still, we call it zombie Reaganism. You know, they, they just want to try to keep going back to Reagan when Reagan just doesn't matter anymore. The, the problems are different. Um, and I think JD uh, represents the future of the Republican Party and of conservatism in America. Final question for you, Rod. Our time is up. Um, linking back to your talk, if you could choose one of those Slovak figures that you mentioned, uh, if you could choose one of them and have a chance to meet them, what question would you ask one of these Slovak guys? I would love to meet Father Kolakovic, who was really, he wasn't really Slovak, he was Croatian, just because he was such a mysterious figure. We still don't know where his grave is. You know, he was, he was everywhere and nowhere. That is like such a story, uh, it's like a spy story about what he saw and what he did. But um, I'm gonna assume that he's technically Croatian, so I, I, I'll say it, uh, my second choice would be Silvo Kirchmeri. 
Because when I read his book that Uri and Timo and the others gave to me, it just pierced my heart that a man, a young man, when he went into prison could have that kind of courage. Do you know he said in his book that when the STB pulled him off the street, put, threw him in the car, arresting him, he burst out laughing. They said, why are you laughing? He said, because I knew this day was coming and I'm glad I have a chance to suffer for Christ. That kind of spiritual maturity is something we all need. It's something I need. You know, I mentioned, I uh, got personal and talked about my own struggles as my marriage is broken apart. I have been, I've had everything taken from me, almost everything I cared for in my life. There's a lot more to the story than I've shared or that I can share, but I've had almost everything taken from me and yet I've never felt closer to Christ. I feel like I've had a slightest taste of what Dr. Kirchmary experienced and what these men that, and women that Timo profiled and took pictures of, what they experienced. And I, I, I feel embarrassed to even compare my experience of a failed marriage to the experience of being in, in a communist prison. But the idea of suffering, of loss, of intense loss, that you, I, I was so stuck inside my head with nostalgia for the marriage that I wanted to recover, for the happy family life I used to have, and nothing I did. I did everything the priest said, I did everything the therapist said, nothing worked. I was stuck in nostalgia for that. But um, God brought me out of that, and it was thinking and reading more about Dr. Kirchmary and what it was like, how he got through his time of trial that inspired me. I would love to sit there with him because I had this picture in my head of him. I saw him before he died in, I think, 2012 or 2013. I don't think he had all of his teeth, but he's the merriest man. He was so happy. I would love to just sit with him and put my hand on his knee and talk to him. And the one question you would ask to him? I would ask him how to pray. Tell me how to pray. I do pray, but I want to pray like he prayed. I want to, to find a way to focus all my attention on Christ. You know, this is the book I'm working on now. I'm writing a book about re-enchantment. Uh, it's not about Disney and pixie dust and all that. It's about how we can learn again to see that God is everywhere present and fills all things. And what I'm learning in my research is that so much of this has to do with focused attention. If your attention is fragmented, it becomes a lot harder to sense the presence of God. And uh, I got the impression from reading Dr. Kirchmary that he was a master of prayer, of focused prayer. And I would want to learn about that. Well, what better note to finish our discussion about the soul of Central Europe than having a chance, than thinking about the chance of asking Dr. Kirchmeri how he would pray. Uh, thank you, Rod, for uh, coming to Košice. Thank you for giving us this talk. Thank you for the discussion. It was a great pleasure to have you, and we'll be happy that you'll be here with us for a few more days, I hope. Yeah, yeah, I will, and um, I, I really do feel like I'm coming home. You know, last summer when I was living in Budapest with my son, Matthew, who's in college, I brought him to Bratislava because I wanted him to meet my friends here. I wanted him to feel like that, to introduce him to Slovakia, my Slovak friends, and help them become part of his life too. And now when he finishes college this fall, he's gonna to move to Budapest to live with me and to settle here. So uh, you'll be seeing not just me next year, but two of us. Yeah, well, it's about a high time we prepare a, a Slovak language course for Rod, I think. <laughs> thank so you thank you once again. Thank you. Ďakujeme Rodovi Dreherovi aj moderátorovi dnešného večera, Samuelovi Trizuliakovi. Môžeme zatlieskať. No a ďakujeme aj našim partnerom a podporovateľom. Menovite je to Košický samozprávny kraj, DKC Veritas a CN. Hlavní partnery festivalu sú Fond na podporu umenia, ktorý podporil festival z verejných zdrojov spoločnosť Plaut, opáctvo Radu pre monštrátov, Lesy Jasov a nadácie Fides et Ratio. Hlavní mediálni partnery, konzervatívny denník Postoj, portál Nové mesto a denník Štandard. Zároveň, zároveň by som vás chcel ešte povzbudiť, ak sa vám páči tento festival a vidíte zmysel v tom, čo robíme, tak nás prosím podporte aj finančne. Môžete to urobiť prostredníctvom 
nášho webu slh.sk alebo QR kódu, ktorý vidíte aj na obrazovke. No a keď budete odchádzať, zavítajte aj do nášho KHD shopu, kde môžete nájsť rôzne knihy, medzi inými aj knihy dnešného hostia Roda. Keď ho poprosíte, možno vám ich aj podpíše, ale to neviem, sa ho spýtajte. No a je tam časopis Verbum a okrem toho takéto vynikajúce štýlové ponožky s logom KHD. Takže môžete si ich zakúpiť a aj takto podporiť náš festival. No a počas celého festivalu ešte prebieha také losovanie, kde môžete vyhrať rôzne balíčky, kde budú aj takéto skvelé ponožky a iné knihy. Stačí, keď sa pri šope alebo priamo v šope zaregistrujete, tam je len taký formulár, vypíšete, hoďte do košíka a v nedelu budeme losovať viacerých výhercov, uvidíme ešte koľkých, ale asi troch a možno aj viac. Uvidíme, koľko bude zaregistrovaných, takže čím viac, tým viac vylosujeme. No a po tejto diskusii bude prestávka a potom 8.30 začína ďalšia diskusia na výške do hĺbky, ako nepreflákať študentské roky. 